Okay, so I think we have everybody in place, so we're just going to go ahead and get started here. We're running a little late, but still here. <laughs> so today's uh, plenary panel is entitled Overcoming the Citizen Government Gap, New Strategies for Successful Communities and a Successful Democracy. So we've launched this conference with a premise, perhaps unproven, that by reimagining civic participation and by implication involving the public more deeply in civic action and decision making, especially in collaboration with local government, we will improve governance, we will make our communities more livable, and we will reach a better place uh, around the issues, the complex issues that we care about. Now, some of these uh, uh, statements, though, beg some questions, and so I'm going to offer those to the panel, and you guys can run with them, or as I suspect, simply run in whatever direction you choose. <laughs> so here are a couple framing questions. So what do we mean by a successful community? What does that mean? What does effective public engagement look like in your worldview? Or what are effective strategies in your experience? Are we improving democracy with a capital D? In other words, can we say we are at the edge of a renaissance of democracy in America? Or are we simply making a few stabs in the dark, or as we Italians like to say, throwing some spaghetti on the wall and seeing what sticks? So with that, I'm going to introduce our panelists. First up is uh, John Dickert. He is in his second term as mayor of Racine, Wisconsin, and we're very grateful that he's taken the time to come and join us. He is working with the community on a 10-year plan that began in 2009 to build Racine into one of the best cities in America. One of his first acts as mayor was to create a budget with a 0% increases without sacrificing services or employment. He aims to make Racine a global leader in freshwater technology, and the city is taking action by partnering with businesses to reduce its carbon footprint and protect the quality of water, specifically Lake Michigan and save money while protecting the environment. And there's a number of initiatives that he's you know, been leading that are really, really fascinating. Look forward to hearing about that. To his left is David Holwork, and we're very grateful for David. He's literally flown in this morning and will be flying out this afternoon from Dayton, Ohio, where he serves as Director of Communications and Resident Scholar for the Kettering Foundation in Dayton, Ohio. He plays an active role in the foundation's research on the public-government relationship and the role of media and journalism in democracy. And so before coming to Kettering, he worked for over 30 years as a journalist uh, for newspapers in Kentucky, Minnesota, and California, gained experience as a copy editor, reporter, editorial page editor, managing editor, and editor-in-chief in these many uh, venues. He managed staffs with which won numerous national awards including two Pulitzer Prizes, so we're excited to have his take on these questions. To his left is Ed Miller. Ed is professor of political science and co-director of the Center for the Small City, which is basically the sponsor of this conference, and he's the Eugene Katz Letters and Science Distinguished Faculty Member at UW-Stevens Point. He and his partner in crime, Bob Olensky, have been the principal organizers of the Small City Conference since 1978. It's quite a while. You might also like to know that after consulting his abacus, Ed calculated that he has been on the job well over four decades at Stevens Point and um, has, is currently the longest serving faculty member at that institution and has a wonderful record of publications and books and articles and has been recognized for his work in addressing problems faced by small cities. And finally, last but not least, is Mike Huggins, former city manager for Eau Claire. During his tenure as city manager, he developed a reputation as a public practitioner and expert on how local government can successfully engage with the public as collaborators in democratic decision making. Along with some other visionary citizens in Eau Claire, Mike helped found Clear Vision, a citizen planning and action group based on the public achievement model that Harry Boyd discussed uh, during his keynote that has been remarkably successful in bringing citizens together to address and solve real and complex problems faced in, in the community. Currently, Mike serves as a leading practice service provider at the Center for Management Strategies for the International City Managers Association. We are so grateful to have you for, and I'm going to turn it over to John. Thank you, 
All right, first of all, you guys are cracking me up. Come on up front for crying out loud. I mean, this isn't that big of a group. Everybody's sitting in the back, making sure that they don't fall asleep for lunch. We will see you if you fall asleep. <laughs> it's not that far away. Um, I'm going to try to keep uh, the comments kind of short because I, I believe that your questions are actually the most important part of being here and being able to actually answer some of those questions. So I'm going to try to go through this. Overcoming the citizen government gap and new strategies to successful communities. Well, first of all, let's, let's, take, a, let's take a snapshot of where we are. Mayors are, for the most part, the end of the line. We can't print money like the federal government can, and we cannot pass legislation down and mandates down to the local government like the state can. So we are really the bottom of the hill. Some people will say everything that, a word that I'm not going to use, would roll down to the bottom of that hill, and some of the mayors would agree that's probably where we are. But Act 32 put us in a real tough place uh, four years ago where you have a levy cap on the cities. That's like saying to you, congratulations, you're never going to get paid more than you are today for the rest of your life. Now, if you're, you know, 69, that might not be such a bad idea, but if you're 20, your future doesn't look very bleak because your cable bill goes up and your phone bill goes up and everything goes up, but you still have the same amount of money. That's what Act 32 did to cities. It basically strangleholds cities. Um, then you've got the federal government who basically, due to inaction, is leaving no hope for our citizens because they watch these folks and they don't feel like they're engaged because no one's listening. Everybody's arguing, talking heads are arguing. Uh, and we'll talk more about that later in the Q&A. At the local level, 62% of the American public believes that they wanna see leadership and a vision from their elected officials. So one of the things that we did was we put together a 10-year plan for the city of Racine and said, if we follow this plan, we should be one of the top 10 countries in America to live in after 10 years and we're implementing that day by day. Uh, but they're also looking for leadership. So what we try to do is provide good leadership to let them know the direction and then bring them into that, in that engagement. But I think it's all about little wins. And what I mean by that is if you were a Packer fan during the 70s, we weren't winning. And they were really satisfied with an eight and eight record. Well, you know what? A new group came in and said, we're not satisfied until we win the Super Bowl. And all of a sudden, people got used to winning. And once they get used to winning, I will guarantee you, they will not like losing. And this is the most depressed state in the world when we lose a game on Sunday. And you see it every Monday morning. But that's because we're used to winning, and I think we have to show that. Because that helps gain their trust. So legislators in Wisconsin, you know, God bless them, but they have done a great job of dividing people. And candidly, so has Washington whether it's voter ID laws that separate people and say you've got to do this, or Washington literally talking about bobblehead ideas that has no resonance down to the local level. And, and every time I go to Washington, the first thing I want to do is come home uh, because there's nothing going on out there. And there's a gene, and we have a, we have a new mayor here today. Uh, there's a gene that you get in, injected in you when you become a mayor, and it's, it's caffeination because you're so worked up about getting things done and you want to get things accomplished as a mayor, and when you go out to D.C., you actually get very, very frustrated because they're not talking about important things. They're not getting things done. So you've got young people who are not voting, who are upset. You've got minorities who are not voting, who are being demagogued. It's basically, you've got the elderly and union people voting, and that's about it right now. And we're going to talk about that in a second, about the recipe for uh, fixing that, because the recipe for disaster is here today. And if every, any of you were here to listen... Uh, to the speaker last night, you know, the recipe for disaster is actually right before us. And that's the recipe of hate. Uh, I don't allow my kids to use the word hate in my house. And the reason I don't is because I say it's a, it's a four-letter word like all the other four-letter words. You can disagree with someone, but you should never hate someone. And between mass media, social media, and people, we hate each other now, and that's a horrible thing. That's a horrible place to be. And I don't think that we should ever be doing that. I think we should disagree, but we should never hate people. And I think that's part of the recipe for disaster. There's no planning. There's no planning going on anywhere. Everybody's living day by day. I always say that we're more worried about the next election than we are the next generation. And, and that's something that I will tell you that will ruin this country. There is no infrastructure planning. 
So even if you take it from a local to a state to a federal to a global level, the rest of the world is kicking our tail right now because they are building their infrastructure that will compete against us very, very well uh, moving forward. And we're seeing climate change right now. I don't care what you want to call it. All I'm telling you is, as a mayor, it's happening. So we were not preparing for it. We're not ready for it. Our infrastructure is not being designed for it. And because of that, it will do one thing that no one wants to hear. It will raise your taxes. It is inefficient and ineffective what we're doing right now. And we have to change that. Or all of this conversation about people and voting will not matter. So what do we do to change it? Well, you talk to people. Candidly, I wish this room was, fact, uh, was packed and I wish we had overflow coming out of here because not enough people are listening to this conversation right now. Uh, not because I'm up here, but because of the conversation we're having about what's happening. Because I will tell you this, I do not want to be a lifetime politician. As a matter of fact, I dread the thought. I'm here to fix the community of Racine for my kids. Okay, I'll admit it. I'm a little parochial. I'm a little selfish. But I want to fix the community for my kids. And that's what we should all be designing our efforts around right now, is our kids. Because if we're not planning for them and not working to fix our community for them, then what are we leaving them? All the statistics in the world, and I've got my guy back there, that good-looking guy back there. You want to start throwing up some of the stuff that, that we had? Um, this is one of the things that, that is above, uh, in the state capitol, above the governor's conference room desk. The will of the people is the law of the land. Does anyone in America right now believe that to be true with governments? Not at all. Are they working for our children's future? Absolutely not. And we can point it out because why? We have no choice as mayors but to do that. Efficiency and effectiveness to fix what's going on. Mike, what's our next slide? I don't even remember. Pull up the next one. There it is. It's not what you say, it's what people hear. You hear the bobbling heads, you hear the Trumps out there of the world, you hear all these politicians running for president right now, they're all talking blah, 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 but how many times does the average citizen listen to them and go, oh, that resonates with me? <clears throat> well, I will tell you, as long as you have a teleprompter in front of you, you're not resonating with the American public. Because when you're doing this all day long, la, 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 you are not looking at the people and having a conversation with them. You're also not looking and thinking about our kids if all you're worrying about is, is a teleprompter. Mike, throw the next one up there. This is the other problem that we're dealing with right now. We have no middle class. It's slowly coming back, but the reality is we have no middle class. Look at the drop in the middle class. We're going to talk about this later as the income level that's going around, and hopefully you'll ask a, a questions about it, but whether it's our, the food that we eat, the health care that we're paying for because of the food that we eat, the lack of infrastructure that we have, we are not on the right path. So how do we change that? Mike, what's the next slide? Power concedes nothing without a demand. Never will and it never will end. Why do we say that? Because right now what we do is if you're running for president of the United States, Bill Clinton, when he ran in the 90s, spent $42 million and everybody said, oh my Lord, it'll never be touched. No one will ever spend that much money. That's ridiculous how much he spent to run for president. To run for president today, you need a billion dollars. If you need a billion dollars to run for president, I did the math. It's $4.70 from every individual living in America currently, including babies. You can't raise that money without that. So who are we controlling? Who's doing what? If we don't start turning this around and get voters to see the change, to see what's happening, to see what's going on at the local level and how it's impacting them, but more importantly, start asking them, what they need. Careers, not jobs. Quality of life, not lower taxes. It's those types of conversations that we have to have here and with them. Because I will tell you, we need to show them the future and we need to have the conversation about the importance of water, the importance of, of, of energy, 
in how we're going to work with our energy, the importance of good food and a good economy where you can form a career. We need to start having the conversation about the good news because there's one thing I can guarantee you. There will always be bad people and there will always be bad news and there will always be bad people sending out bad comments and bad news. But I will leave you with this. One of my bosses in the state legislature reminded me of something very important when I was upset one day because we didn't get a budget bill in. And she said, John, don't worry about it. Us good people, we have to work 24-7 because the bad people always do. We have to continue the fight for positive news, positive stories, and showing people a positive future because without it, I will guarantee you one thing, negative will win. And if it does, there's no place in this society for our kids. And candidly, between you and I, I refuse to let that happen. Thanks. If it's all right with you folks, I'd just stay seated. I, who, on, who wants to follow an elected official at the podium, not I? <clears throat> um, I elected not to have PowerPoint on the screen. Um, I thought about whether to have PowerPoint at all because I try to try to live my life with, with the rule, I don't need no stinking PowerPoint, but I, I concluded um, that, I, that I did want to have it, but I printed it for a couple of reasons. One, I'm an old print guy, um, but the other is I want you to, I hope you, you keep these around and see if they eventually spark something in you. I work at the Kettering Foundation, which is an institution, a research institution. It's not a grant maker, so don't ask. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> what, what we study, my, my version, of, my take on what we study is that we study the work of citizens, communities, and institutions in democracy. We're not particularly interested in elections. We're not particularly interested in electoral reform. We're interested in the things that give citizens the power to have some control over their lives some greater measure of control. We're interested in, in citizens having the ability to, to engage in self-rule. One of the things, and we, we look at institutions and, and communities, and one of the things that I've been puzzling about, and we've been puzzling about at the foundation, is this sort of oddity that, that is, that we appear to be in a, I don't know if we, we're not in a golden age of democracy, but we appear to be in a golden age of public or civic engagement. I mean, you can hardly turn around without stumbling over somebody who is doing public engagement. Newspapers have public engagement editors. There's public engagement here, public engagement there. The rhetoric and rubric of public engagement is it suddenly everywhere. So I put together these charts. It just, you've all got one. It's just going to go through them real fast. <coughs> this one I knew about, confidence in newspapers. It's old news. It's, it pains me. Here's confidence in public schools. These are all from Gallup, who's been looking at these over the years. Confidence in TV news. Confidence in Congress. See a trend? And then they're all, all in one page. <coughs> confidence in all of these with Congress having started low and lower than everything but newspapers, but far outstripping everything to lose public confidence. Now, people like the mayor here are going to tell me, and perhaps political scientists are going to say, well, yeah, but it's not, that's not true of state and local government. And in fact, that's true, as you can see on the next page. But don't get to feeling too good about it because the Pew Research Center asked, didn't ask about confidence, but they've been asking about favorable view. And everybody, Washington's still terrible, but from 2001 to 2013, favorable view of local governments went, I apologize, these are not easy to read. That light yellow line, they went from 68 to 63, a five point drop which is slightly outside the margin of error. But um, state government went from 66 to 57, a nine point drop. But these, this la so there's no, nobody has anything to feel particularly good about. And I should say that this is not a US trend. 
decline in, inst in confidence in institutions is a, is a trend throughout the developed world. It appears to be, as my friend and colleague Bill Bishop said, says it's a, it's a condition of modern life. But the other condition of modern life is the rise of public engagement. Now, I tried to find some way to measure it. But you know, nobody. There's no central clearinghouse that every agency and has to has to put, uh, put has to file a report about put what they're doing. So I, I finally found this as the best, with the aid of actual researchers at Kettering who know what they're doing, found this as the best sort of stand-in we could we could find, which is scholarly articles on public engagement from 2070 to 2009. So when you look at that curve, and you look at if this is a reasonable stand-in for the increase in the practice of public engagement by institutions, including government, and you look at the curves of, of that confidence and a positive view, you come up with the question, is public engagement, at least I come up with the question, is public engagement actually making things worse? in terms of confidence in government in other institutions. Now, I'm not, I'm not dumb enough to say there's a causal relationship. There's a, there's a correlation in time between these two things, but there's a correlation in time <clears throat> between an increase in the drinking of Leinenkugel's beer and the appearance of the Packers in a, in a Super Bowl. So, you know, and one doesn't cause the other, um, although it doesn't hurt, um, but, but, and then I got to think about what could possibly, if, if, there, if there is something about public engagement that contributes to it, to this decline of confidence, what would it be? Well, one thing it could be, uh, and this is just speculative, but one thing it could be is that public en many public engagement initiatives, and probably none uh, uh, instituted by people in this room, but because they're all perfect, but many of them um, amount to uh, amount to telling people what you have already decided to do and asking them to support it, um, and they operate under the notion that um, that if you just educate these people, they will come to see the wisdom of what you're about to do, and they will they will prove they will appreciate it. I've, God knows that was the case in the corporate newspapers I worked for. Uh, surprisingly, nobody appreciated it when we tried it. But um, and another is that people who work in the kinds of agencies that do public engagement um, are largely technocrats. And they talk in the language of technocrats. If they are transportation planners, they talk in in terms of what is efficient, what is um, what is safe. This highway is safe. We have to build it to these standards. We have to, to be safe. We have to build it on this path because of, of cost efficiency. People who live in the towns don't think about that. I mean, it's not that they're uninterested in it, but they're engaged in things around questions like, what kind of town do I want this to be? Um, the question's much like the mayor was posing. What, what, what kind of future do we want for our kids here? Do we want our kids to be able to stay here? Um, is it, what's it going to do to to the neighborhood, to the schools, to the property values? Because people are engaged with already engaged in questions that are important to them. They're engaged in things that they hold to be valuable. So I was thinking about this, and I'm reading my hometown paper now, the Dayton Daily News, and I see a, a little blurb they. Uh, on Mondays, they fill up part of the paper with little little news from various counties, and there's something about the an agency I'd never heard of called the Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission that's having that it was having open comment. On, it was a public participation about the draft public participation policy for the for the formulation of the 2040, I believe, regional transportation plan. So I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to go look at it. So I printed it out. It's 40-something um, pages and plus appendices. And I, I feel confident that it is by any 
professional standard, a highly competent, it may be a prize-winning uh, draft for public participation, participation plan, for all I know. But I started reading it. And I thought to myself, and, and I, you know, I'm a former journalist. I have learned over the years how to read things like this, um, sort of. Um, but I, I tried to read it from the standpoint of, if I was a citizen who saw this thing in the Dayton Daily News and thought, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get engaged here because I think transportation is important. And I don't have any, st I don't work for a trucking company or, or a highway contractor or an environmental lobbying group. Um, I just wanted, and I'm gonna, gonna try to read this. So I started reading it and I came to a number of conclusions. Uh, it has state's objectives. They, I'm not gonna read them to you, but it has an unstated objective, I realized, because in the first four pages, in the first page, there are four acronyms for public agencies that are of four letters or more. The simplest one is ODOT, the Ohio Department of Transportation. And I realized that one of the unstated objectives is to teach citizens to talk the language of technocrats. I mean, you cannot participate in this without talking the language of technocrats. Then I'm going on and I find uh, they list who the <clears throat> they list public part participation considerations. I'm not going to go into, but there are basically a, a, there are three to four paragraphs that are, again are studded with technical terms and and um, uh, acronyms. Now this is not a matter of editing, and this is not language quibbling. This is a matter of this is a matter of who is privileged to participate in this discussion. And you can't be fixed with editing because, it, because it, it's, it's, not, it's not about the word choice, it's about who is able to participate. I get the stakeholders, and there are a list about 14 of them. The, there are three that don't involve people with some kind of technical, who are not technocrats people who live in or traverse a project area, civic and community associations, and representatives of users of pedestrian and bicycle transportation facilities, although lots of those people now speak the language of technocrats. I, I could go on in this, but my, my point is that if I'm a citizen and I pick this up, even if I'm a fairly sophisticated user of government documents, if I am, I, what I'm looking for is what are the uh, what are the places in here where I can have some effect, where my participation is not just the participation of going to a meeting and taking my three minutes and sitting down, but where I can participate in some way that gives me some greater control, has the prospect to give me some greater control over my life. You can't figure out where it would be. Now, if I'm working for a if I'm a lobbyist working for a highway contractor. I know exactly where those points are, but um, so, so you take this kind of public, and like I say, I think this is highly professional, first rate. I know it meets every federal and state requirement. But when, excuse me, but when you when you take this as a citizen, take the experience of trying to engage through a process outlined this way, and multiply it across the range of public public engagement initiatives that are going on, what you get is a citizenry, is a group of citizens who throw up their hands and say, I quit. I don't know how to do this. I don't see where I can enter it. I don't believe I can, I have any prospect to be effective. Um, so, you know, newspaper guys are always, always telling the bad news. And, I, and you know, so the, the mayor said we need good news, but, you know, you got the wrong guy to follow him for that. Um, I mean, there are things, to, that obviously, that can be done. You can frame arguments. You can frame issues in terms of things that are valuable to people, not in terms that are, not in the terms of, of, of the technocrats. You can listen to what people say and see what that is important to them and see if that has any relation to what's being proposed. 
you can um, you can ask a simple question like, what is there actually for in this for citizens to do? Because there's not something for them to do other than stand up and talk for three minutes. They ain't going to do it. They're not going to bother with the, you know, you'll get the usual suspects showing up for three minutes, or you'll, you'll breed another set of dissatisfied, disgruntled um, citizens who lack confidence in, in government. So that's why I printed this stuff out, because I, um, I printed that thing out, because I hope that you, that you folks will, will think about the, this, this prospect at any rate, that the, the process in, of that, that some of the processes of public engagement are actually counterproductive, that it's digging the hole deeper rather than creating a path out of it. Thank you. Mm, let's see, push. Oops. Turned it off there. I was asked to, actually, uh, Harry Boyd was supposed to be on this panel. Uh, today, but he had to leave uh, to go to Johannesburg. Uh, so I was asked to replace him, and uh, if you saw him last night, he was wearing a, a hat, and uh, I thought about a similar hat, but I look like uh, a racetrack bookie. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then another kind of hat, I look like uh, I'm in the yeshiva. So I decided <laughs> to skip the hat. <laughs> So anyway, I'm going to talk a little about the citizen gap and participation and some of the things that can be done to improve, and are being done to improve uh, citizen participation. Uh, to understand the concept of the gap, one needs to understand democracy itself. Uh, in democracy, there should be no gap, uh, basically. Even if it's not a direct democracy, but a representative democracy, there are ways for citizens to participate in a representative democracy. Now, however, this is often not done. Some of the reasons are probably obvious. One of the reasons is if you look at elections, or particularly the local elections, they're non-competitive. There's people in the city council who have been there for years, or especially the, the county board uh, who have been there for years. Uh, a average age of the county board is pretty high. Some people suggest, suggest some of the county board's average age is deceased. Um, <laughs> And so for a young person to want to wanna, you know, join the county board or run for the county board or the city council, common council in Wisconsin, it's, it's difficult. If you look at the turnout in these elections, they tend to be very low. Uh, Wisconsin does better with turnout generally than most places. We also return our census uh, most, more than most places. Uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Iowa are the are three top. But the fact is that uh, if you look at local elections, you're talking about maybe 20% uh, uh, turning up for local, local elections in Wisconsin. Uh, decisions are often made uh, in meetings that are held at times when people can go, when working people can go. The village of Plover, uh, where, uh, where I live, uh, what, they've actually changed it a little bit, but was holding meetings at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, how can a person who is working get there, get that meeting at four o'clock in the afternoon? Uh, they used to be years, years and years ago, they were seven o'clock at night, which is what, when, the, when a new president of the village took over at the time, uh, he moved it up to four o'clock. And, and an individual who's working may get off at 4.30, let's just say, or uh, five o'clock. They can't obviously make a meeting at, at, at four o'clock. So you're precluding a number of people from coming uh, at the times of the meetings. Information for the meeting are often not available until shortly before the meeting. We see this a, a lot. Uh, this is occurring a lot in our state legislature, by the way, although I'm talking more about local governments, but this is ridiculous. In the state legislature, you put out uh, an entire comprehensive uh, bill and they're voting on it the next day. Uh, they have an hour hearing on it. Uh, that's not democracy, uh, and we're seeing this on the local level too, where uh, very large uh, plans are put out and uh, uh, they're considered a day or two uh, later. The influence of large businesses and developers are, are very strong in local government, 
and we see this especially in Wisconsin, and so average citizens uh, have a very difficult time uh, getting involved in there. And transparency is not, not very strong. Even with the computer and much more information that's out on the internet, the fact is that transparency in what government is doing and information is not there. The open meeting law, uh, which there's an attempt to, to reduce uh, in Wisconsin, but the open meeting law uh, is uh, more uh, followed in terms of procedures than in reality. Now, there are benefits to citizen participation. I'm going to talk about some ways that citizens can participate. Information and ideas on public, uh, public uh, issues can come from citizens as, uh, clearly. Uh, public support for planning decisions, uh, to gain support for these planning decisions, can come from citizens if they're participating. Avoidance of protracted conflicts and costly delays if citizens are involved in the actual decision making uh, of the body. A reservoir of goodwill can carry over future decisions and spirit of cooperation and trust between the agency and the public. All of these can come from, uh, from uh, uh, decisions that involve the, the public. And, and for citizens themselves, it's very important because it's not only instrumental in terms of influencing decisions, that's one, in terms of their involvement, but also what is very important besides just simply uh, it's the act of participating. I mean, there's an aspect of active participating in molding decisions. That, that is very, 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 very important. This was particularly recognized a long time ago, or not that long ago, depends on how old you are, uh, but with the war on poverty. If you remember the war on poverty under uh, President Johnson uh, was the community action agencies. And the community action agencies, the concept of the community action agency underlying it was maximum feasible participation. And the idea was to get the clients, in this case it would poor people, involved in molding the decisions. And it was required by the, by the law on the war on poverty for community action agencies. This wasn't just an accident. This was developed in very uh, strong research done at Columbia University by particularly two people, Olin and Cloward at uh, Columbia University, and they tested this. In the, these were the gray area programs, and it was the gray area programs that were the model for the community action agencies. Those affected could articulate the needs, and the idea was the poor knew the most about their needs. Uh, not social workers or, or others who knew something, obviously, about poverty, but they weren't experiencing poverty. So these individuals could say, this is, this is our needs. This is, our, this is what our needs. Uh, uh, by being involved, there's a buy-in, and it wasn't imposed upon them. Important interaction in the communities and government officials to gain understanding of, the, of each other. Now, what I want to talk about just briefly here, since I don't have much time, uh, I just want to talk about some of the ways in which, uh, some of the more modern ways in which you can get participation other than uh, obviously voting. There's passive ways in terms of voting and more active ways of being involved. One certainly is surveys, surveying the community. And we can survey in all kinds of ways, but some newer ways are through the computer. You can survey with the computer with a panel or the even telephone, where individuals can give their input uh, into the, their computer. But in terms of the surveys, what are you surveying? It's not just a reaction to the decisions uh, that you make. Do you agree or don't agree with the decisions? But it's support for a service, knowledge of a service, existence of, of a service, uh, who uses the service, you can find out. Uh, who uses the bus service? Who, who's, what is the problem with the bus service? Is it the, the, the cleanliness of the bus? Is it the time the bus is run? Is that you find this out through the survey in, in that area. Use of citizen juries and panels are a common way that is now being used. You can select or randomly select uh, people in the, in the community. They can come together. So this is, this is coming together to deliberate over specific issues. Some councils in Chicago, or some, some councilmen in Chicago in their district are using this to make decisions on the allocations of public works money in their district. And so this is a new way that is being used in Chicago to allocate, uh, allocate the money and being involved, having citizens involved in the project. You can have an advisory panel. And uh, Mayor Borwink, for example, has an excellent panel uh, on uh, students. 
the students are involved in this panel. And, and so not only does the city benefit from hearing from the students, the students benefit by being involved. And I bet those students are going to be involved throughout their life uh, in ter terms of that. Certainly social media, we heard about social media earlier in one of the sessions, uh, but certainly social media is a, a very, uh, uh, I mean, it's not, it's relatively new in terms of being involved in this kinds of things, and with Facebook, Twitter, and so forth, but being involved in political participation as a two-way communication. So here we're not talking about just a one-way communication, but a two-way communication. There's certain computer interaction uh, exercises that one can do. One is called Community Planet. And Community Planet is an online engagement game for uh, a local planning effort. It, bringing people together interactively of social networks uh, in this online game. And so this is another way of participation. So the point is that the, just to summarize here, that the current that the way city councils and the way legislatures have run will not be supplanted where they have a hearing and people come up and and testify at that hearing but a whole bunch of new ways can be implemented for citizen participation and this is especially true with regard to cities and uh, whether it's small cities or large cities states have a little bit more problem but you can do it at the state level but clearly you can do it at the, at the uh, local level and cities can do it let me just remember one, one other thing since we're talking about small cities there's been several research done on small cities and what they do find is that participation is greater in small cities than in large cities that there's a lot of reasons for this. Uh, people know each other, the issues are more personal, and, and the like. But what we do find is there's much more participation in turning out at meetings, uh, all kinds of things, voting, uh, 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 contacting your councilman, and so on and so forth. Quickly. I'd like to respond to some of Eric's question. What is a successful community? I think that's one where the people that live there feel safe and secure, have genuine opportunities to thrive and to experience meaning in their lives and understand and exercise their birthright to be co-creators of their public lives. I think that's what a successful community is. I think we know, uh, let me go back. I think the gap is not necessarily the gap between government and citizens. I think it's a growing gap between what we technically and administratively can do and what we have the political will to do. I think we have a growing political will gap, and I think that one of the ways we can address that, fill that gap, is by equipping people in our communities to be more active problem solvers. I agree very much with David's definition or uh, description of the, of the problem. I think many times we see engagement that does not work because the entity doing the engagement, government, foundation, whoever, is applying a technical expertise model to solving problems that are not susceptible to those kinds of problems. Uh, they're wicked problems. I think we see more and more of those where we can't define the problem. We don't have a clear solution and we have to have collaboration, ways of sharing, and how bringing in our everyday people to, uh, to define what that problem is. I think we know what good participation is. It includes, first of all, matching whatever your uh, engagement strategy is to the project. Is it, is it informing? Is it consulting, involving, collaborating, empowering? Many times, citizens think they're coming to an exercise to participate and help make a decision and the entity doing the engagement just wants to inform. So there's a mismatch of the purpose and the promise and the activity that we're doing in the engagement. It all begins with the notion that government is not the epicenter of public problem solving. Many governments still think they are. Many citizens still think the government is. That's not the case. I think we need to find ways to integrate both thin and thick engagement, face-to-face, -face, very intense deliberation, things that use digital media that we can contact a lot of people. It's not an either or, it's both. We have to find ways to do that. We know that good participation means providing factual information, sound group process, providing people the opportunity to share the values that are important to them and tell their stories. Uh, give them a chance to define, describe, and choose among options. 
uh, that they have a sense of their own political legitimacy. That's why they don't participate in the first place. They've been to the public hearing, they've talked for three minutes, and it didn't mean anything. So we need to restore, build people's ability to think they can do something about the issues that matter to them. Uh, we need to support people to be able to take action in multiple ways. There's not just one way of addressing the problems, I think, that we have in our communities. And there are other characteristics. We know what good participation is. Some final points of what we can do specifically. I think we need to work with our government structures, schools, and city and county and town governments to help them move beyond the informing stage of participation and move to involving and collaborating and empowering people to help decide and implement the decisions about the issues that people really care about. Obviously need to move beyond the three minutes at the mic that our enabling uh, uh, statutes pretty much seem to restrict us to. It's not that we replace our public hearings, but we can do more than the public hearings so we can find ways to actually have a two-way conversation. I think we need to establish citizen advisory boards for public participation. Citizens should be involved in deciding how we participate. All the expertise for that is not confined to the government or a foundation or to consultants. Uh, we need to build the capacity of everyday people to be real problem solvers. We need to restore their confidence and their ability to do that. I think we need to provide different professional training for our managers and our planners and our engineers and our finance directors that include engagement and also perhaps helping elected officials, not all officials, have the capacity to listen and engage. There are things we can do with our elected officials. And finally, I'd say that we can take a different look at the citizenship leadership academies that we provide so that there are more than 10 weeks of explaining why the police are really good or why all the departments are doing a great job. And it's an opportunity for citizens and their officials to work together on problems. Finally, the issue of whether we are at a renaissance of democracy, I think we're either in a civic crisis or a civic renewal, and we're certainly changing. We're at a, a point where we're changing what the roles and responsibility of government and citizens and the private sector and civil society is. Which way it goes, I don't know. Some would say it's up to what we do in the future. Thank you. Oh. Folks, we gave them their three minutes. That's all they're getting. <laughs> I really appreciate you guys coming. Thank you so much.